All right, tonight we're going to tackle implicit differentiation. You've been exposed to it before, so tonight I'm going to challenge you to go deeper and, and get a lot stronger with your conceptual understanding of this rule. And what I'm going to try to do throughout the video, especially as we progress through, is to throw some more challenging bears at you to really help you step up your game. But throughout the entire night, I want to continue to emphasize the fact that we all we're doing tonight is using, we're actually using the chain rule. That's really all we're doing repeatedly. We just need to understand what it means to take the derivative with respect to x versus with respect to t versus with respect to any other independent variable. So we're going to practice that throughout the night. So the first thing I want to do is let's just go over a little vocabulary lesson. Just, you know, and these are maybe words that you've used in your everyday conversation, perhaps, implicit versus explicit, and what's the big difference? Well, here's the deal. You, you've Most of the 99% of the equations you've worked with to this point in your math career have been expressed explicitly. Okay, and basically what that means is that y was already by itself. For instance, you know, y equals 2x plus 5 is an explicit equation because y is being expressed explicitly in terms of x. You know, or maybe y equals, you know, 4x squared minus 2 sine of x. Again, that's explicit, y is by itself. It's very straightforward. However, implicit... You know, you've probably uh, had conversations where you've implied certain things, maybe without clearly stating them. Um, same thing here goes with math. An implied equation is one such as, uh, you know, maybe 2xy minus y cubed uh, plus, I don't know, 3x equals 32. Here's an example where neither variable is isolated or solved for. And even if you really wanted to, I think it would be darn near impossible to do so. And then there are implied equations, such as maybe a circle, where this is an implied version right now, but if you really wanted to, you could solve for one of the variables and turn it into an explicit equation. Maybe you said y equals plus or minus the square root of 9 minus x squared. And now you'd have an equivalent function. It just, you know, over here it's implied, over here it's explicit. So let's warm up. I just want to throw out a very simple primitive um, function. Let's, uh, let's maybe take something like, uh, you know, let's try 3x to the fifth. And we're going to derive it with respect to x. Believe it or not, you actually did chain rule way back before you even knew chain rule. Okay. What I want you to tell yourself is that the outer function is 3 times a quantity to the fifth. And the inner function is x. Okay, seems over redundant, but we're going to just go with it for now. So we're going to go through the chain rule, and I'm going to say, um, because, and let me make a note here, we're doing the derivative with respect to x. It's going to be 15, leave the inner alone, subtract 1 from the exponent, and then we're going to multiply by the derivative of the inner function with respect to x. Okay, and what you'll notice is that dx over dx is equivalent to a 1, and that's why we never wasted our time writing that because it was just a 1. So we never wasted our time. Now what if I threw something like 3y to the 5th at you, and I still wanted to do the derivative with respect to x. Again, let's wrap up that y. That's your inner function. So let's go 5 times 3 is 15. Don't touch the inner. Raise it to the 4th. Now take the derivative of what was inside with respect to x. And that's where dy dx was born. So maybe let's go back and try 3y to the 5th again. And let's say this time we wanted to derive it with respect to t instead of x. Again, t is another good example, a very common independent variable. So let's wrap it up. Let's visualize the chain rule. Let's visualize who's outer and who's inner. And I would say the derivative is going to be 15. Don't touch the inner yet. Raised to the 4th. And now we'll multiply by the derivative of what was inside with respect to t. Okay. And there's a little bit of rhythm. You can kind of talk yourself through it there. Now, just for the sake of overkill here, I, I picked a Q. So let's say uh, we want to do 3y to the 5th, and I wanted to derive it with respect to Q. Now, that's not a very common independent variable by any stretch of the imagination, but I just wanted to really make you comfortable with your variables. So let's say 15, we've got y to the 4th, and of course my square brackets are just for extra emphasis, times the derivative of what was inside with respect to, in this case, Q. 
Now, now, now that we've thoroughly beat up that idea of uh, emphasizing chain rule with regards to an implicit problem, let's actually try one. And perhaps the AP's favorite bear trap is I want you to really watch out for product rule here. They're going to try to be very subtle with it, and they're going to try to sneak it by you. But we're going to be uh, we're going to be razor sharp in catching it. So let's try this for our first problem. Let's say they gave us the equation y squared plus x cubed and maybe minus xy and plus the cosine of y and they said that it's equal to 10. Okay. Now you, you'll agree with me right away that this is an implicit equation because neither variable is solved for or isolated and they want us to derive it with respect to x. So just make a note we are deriving with respect to x. And so I'm going to run through this and right off the bat here I'm going to say I got my chain rule so I'm going to 2y to the first times the derivative of y with respect to x plus 3 times x squared times dx dx, but I'm going to forego that. Now what I want you to really jump on here is let's visualize the product rule because we've got the product of x times y. I'm going to leave my minus sign outside. I'm going to then do product rule within the square brackets, and I've got the first times the derivative of the second function plus the second function times the derivative of the first is 1. Um, now as far as cosine, we definitely have, we really, really, really do have chain rule. We've got cosine as the outer, so the derivative of the outer would be negative sine, don't touch the inner, and then finish by taking the derivative of what was inside. That's a very common uh, piece to forget. Equals, and then 10 is just a constant, so his derivative is zero. Now my next goal here is to kind of try to identify how many terms I've really got. I think I've got, let's see, how many terms do we got? We got a term right there, we got a term here. By the time we distribute the negative, we'll have two more terms here, and we've got a fifth term right here. Now, out of those five terms, I'm going to keep all the terms that possess a dy dx. I'm going to keep them on the left side. So I'm going to keep my 2y dy dx over here. I'm going to keep my negative x dy dx over here. And I'm going to keep my negative sine of y times dy dx on the left. Now what I'm going to do in the meantime is I'm going to take the two terms that didn't have a dy dx and I'm going to move them to the other side. Now remember that this y right here is a negative y so I'm going to add it over and then I'm going to subtract the 3x squared. My next step now is to take the GCF out of the left side. In fact it may not be the the greatest common factor but it's going to be a common factor of dy dx. So just factor that out. We're going to have 2y minus x minus the sine of y equals y minus 3x squared. Ladies and gentlemen, one more move. We're going to take this big obnoxious bear and just divide it to the other side. So the derivative of y with respect to x is equal to y minus 3x squared all divided by 2y minus x minus sine y. And I've got to tell you, when you're doing an implicit derivative, how common do you think it is to end up with a, a fraction? And I would say it's extremely common. I'd say if you didn't get a fraction, boy, I'd start to wonder if something, if I did something wrong. Okay, for our next example, I want to practice writing the equation of a tangent line, or WETL, that I commonly refer to here. Um, whoops, oh goodness. Okay. Um, so anyway, we want to find the equation of both the tangent and the normal lines. Don't worry about normal yet. Okay, the normal is going to be a piece of cake. Just put all of your energy into getting this tangent line, and then we'll worry about normal lines later. So what I'm going to do is they already gave me the x and the y coordinate, which is beautiful. All I need to do is derive this function implicitly and then evaluate it at 0 comma pi and I'll have my instantaneous slope. So I recognize the product rule right away between x squared and cosine squared. So my product rule says let's do the first function times the derivative of the second. Now, I've got a lot of chain rule right there, okay? I've got the squared is my outer, cosine's my middle, and y is my inner. So I've got outer, middle, inner. I'm going to say 2 times the cosine of y to the first power times negative sine of y, and then the derivative of the innermost gives me my dy dx. Whew, that was a mouthful. All right, finish the product rule now. So I've got plus the second function times the derivative of the first function, which would be 2x. Uh, the nice simple one here, we've got minus the cosine of y times dy dx. I kind of running off the side of the screen, and that equals 0. All right, let's see. How many terms do we really have? Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. This entire thing is one term. And then I've got a second term here and a third term here. And I'm going to just keep, I'm going to keep the first and the third term on the left side. 
So I've got, how do I want to write this? Let's go negative 2x squared, cosine of y, sine of y, dy dx. Then the third term is going to be minus cosine of dy dx. And that's going to equal negative 2x cosine squared of y. Now you'll notice all three terms now are negative. So I'm just going to distribute a negative 1 through the equation to create all positives. That was fun. Then I'm going to factor out, not the greatest common factor, but I'm going to factor out a common factor of dy dx. There's no need to factor out more than that. And that gives me 2x squared cosine of y sine y plus the cosine of y equals 2x cosine squared. And then just take what's left over in the square brackets, divide it to the other side, and we've got ourselves a big monster fraction. And it's going to look a little something like this. Now, notice we're not done, are we? Okay, they didn't say just simply find the derivative. What I need to do now, and I'm going to show you a little bit of new notation here and what I'm expecting from you. Move the screen here. How do we evaluate this? I want you to say we're going to take the derivative and we're going to evaluate it. That's what that long line means. We're going to evaluate it specifically at the point 0 comma pi. And the 0 pi is almost like kind of a subscript. And what that's going to do is that's going to show, it's going to be my way of communicating to the greater that I'm going to plug this point into the derivative. Now as I plug a 0 into this x here, it just creates a 0 in the entire numerator. As I plug a 0 into that x, I get another 0. And then as I go cosine of pi, I'm going to get a negative 1. Either way, I've got 0. So here's my line. y minus pi equals 0 times the quantity x minus 0. Now, I've been stressing a lot that we don't need to clean these up, but this one's too obvious. And I think it's going to help us do the normal line, too. y equals pi is the tangent line. And that's simply a horizontal line. I hope you agree. Now, visualize this. And I don't know what that function actually looks like. But if I'm visualizing something here where I've got a horizontal tangent line, What's my vertical, or I'm sorry, what's my normal line going to be? My normal line's got to be perpendicular and therefore be um, vertical. So, let's see. Writing the equation of a vertical line is a little tricky. Our formula here, y minus y1 equals m quantity x minus x1, that really doesn't work when you write a vertical line. You just have to know what the x-coordinate of that point was. And since the x-coordinate was 0, I'm going to say that x equals 0 was the equation of the normal line. So the normal line was vertical, whereas the tangent line was nice and horizontal. All right, now I want to get into some conceptual stuff here about horizontal and, and vertical tangent lines with regards to these crazy implicit derivatives. Now to save some time, I'm not going to throw a, a real example at you, but what I want you to know, as we discussed earlier, we said um, you know, 99% of the time these derivatives end up being fractions, right? So let's say we've got um, you know, ax plus b for a numerator, and maybe we've got you know, ax squared plus uh, by plus c or something like that for my denominator. Just making that up. Here's what we want to do. If they want horizontal tangent lines, what we know is that every horizontal tangent line ever created in the world of math is guaranteed to have a slope of zero. And if the slope is zero, then we're going to say that our derivative needs to be equal to zero. And if we set our original derivative here equal to zero, all we're going to do is we're going to cross multiply. And what's going to happen is this denominator is going to die out every time when it multiplies the zero. So what's going to happen is we're always going to get the numerator equal to zero every single time. And then from there, you could solve for whatever variable you need to solve for. But the bottom line is, if we want horizontal tangent lines, we're going to end up setting our numerator equal to zero every single time. Now let's think about the vice versa here. Let's take that same crazy derivative that I just made up off the top of my head, and I believe it was ax plus b all over ax squared plus by plus c. Okay, now we want vertical tangent lines. So you're visualizing, I don't know, uh, let's see, maybe I can create a curve that's got a vertical tangent. Yeah. All right, so, you know, grab, put this little sketch in your notebook, and I would say, like, right there at that one point right there, we have a vertical tangent line. And what special characteristic do all vertical lines have in common? All vertical lines have, let's see here, visualize your vertical line. It's guaranteed to have a slope that is what we call undefined, or we say it doesn't exist. So if the slope doesn't exist, then we need to say that the derivative doesn't exist. Now, how do you set a derivative equal to doesn't exist? Well, you don't really. But what you can say is 
this fraction, if it didn't exist, what that means is the denominator must have a value of 0. If the denominator had a value of 0, then that would force the entire fraction, and in this case, the derivative, to be 0. So that's all we're going to do. Every time they ask for vertical tangent lines, we're going to instantly set our denominators equal to 0, and then solve for whatever appropriate variables there are. Okay, one of our second to last slide here tonight, they want to find a second derivative. And, and by now, you've, you've done enough calculus to know that basically uh, the second derivative is not very hard. It's just basically the first derivative of the first derivative. So, but anyway, let's do this. Let's take a look at 4y squared plus 2 equals 3x squared. And a uh, very friendly function here. And there's just one little bear trap that I want to really emphasize as we get halfway through this problem. So the first derivative is going to look like this. 8y times dy dx plus 0 equals 6x to the first dx dx. Okay. And then we solve for dy dx. Strongly encourage you to do that before you go any further. So we've got 6x over 8y. And if we want to reduce it a little bit, that would be 3x over 4y. Okay, so we're halfway home, right? All right, now all I'm going to do to find the next derivative, I'm going to uh, do some quotient rule. Now what we're really doing here is we're taking another derivative with respect to x. So what's going to happen is, check out this new notation. In the numerator, we're going to say d, what looks like d squared, but it's not really y, all over dx quantity squared. It's not, don't think of them as squares. They're really just notation for second derivative. And then we're going to run through our quotient rule. We've got the lower function times the derivative of the upper function minus high d low. It's not just 4. It's going to be 4 dy dx. Make sure we got that in there. All over the lower function, all squared. All right, now here's the trick. And here's where I want you to really make an asterisk here in your notebook. We are never going to leave a dy dx in our second derivative. Oops. All right, got that? We're never going to leave a dy dx in our second derivative. Probably should write the first half of that sentence, huh? Never leave a dy dx in our second derivative. Well, what are we going to do? We'll go back and look at what you said your answer was for dy dx. We're going to substitute in there. So here's what I've got cooking. I'm going to say that the second derivative is equal to, let's see, we got a 12y for the first term, minus 12x in the substitution. For this dy dx right there, I'm going to put 3x over 4y in his place. That's a nice substitution. All over 16y squared. And then, uh, da, 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 can we clean this up a smidge? we got kind of a complex fraction here. So let's see if we can clean it up a hair. And so it's going to equal, let's go 12y minus... Da, 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 Let's see, that reduces to a 3, so we've got 9x squared all over y, over 16y squared. Now, because it's a complex fraction, what I want you to do is... All right, I've got to throw one more example at you, and it involves an e. So let's just remind ourselves that the derivative of, you know, e to the u power, where u is a function of x, is going to be e to the u times the derivative of u. And again, u is a function of x. Now let's try this. What if I wanted to derive, let's say, e to the y power, but I'm doing the derivative with respect to x. It would be e to the y times the derivative of y with respect to x. It would look exactly like that. So let's try this example. Let's try e to the 3x plus 2y equals the sine of xy. Let's see if we can take this derivative. So I've got e to the, in this case, what I call the u power, times the derivative of the exponent, 3 plus 2 times dy dx equals, i got chain rule, so I'm going to go cosine of xy times the derivative of the inside. And the inside, I saw product rule, so I'm going to go x times dy dx plus y times the derivative of the first, which is a 1. All right, now from here, what we'd have to do is a lot of distributing. Okay, and I'm going to get you part way, and then I'm going to let you try to finish it. And it'll be one of the things that I look for in your notebook. But let's see. If I distribute that e, I'm going to get this plus 2 times e to the 3x plus 2y dy dx equals, um, let's, how do we want to write this? Let's go x cosine of xy dy dx. And I'm running out of room, but there'll be y cosine of 
x, y. So basically what I want you guys to do now on your own is to isolate dy, dx, get it all by itself, and when we do a notebook check tomorrow, I'm just going to look for the completion of that problem and see what you got for a fraction over here, all right? Good luck. Way to hang in there.